Greetings, one and all, and welcome to another episode of Hideouts. Today, excuse my squeaky chair, we have predecessor to Al Capone and a tremendous force in the organized crime world of the 19, well, 10s, 20s, and 30s. Today's guest is Johnny Torrio. Born Giovanni Torrio in Ircina, then known as Monte Peloso, Basilicata, Southern Italy, on January 20th, 1882, to Tommaso Torrio and Maria Carluccio. Giovanni was only two years old when his father died while working for the railway. Shortly after the death, he was taken to the Lower East Side of New York City by his mother, where she later remarried. She knew what she wanted, and she went for it. In his teenage years, Giovanni worked as a porter and a bouncer in Manhattan. This was also the period of his life when he decided to join the James Street Gang with a friend from the neighborhood. That gang may sound familiar from previous episodes. He made money committing petty crimes and saved enough to begin his own operations in billiards and loan sharking. This caught the eye of the Five Points Gang leader, Paul Kelly. Torrio began to work with him, running numbers, and caught the eye of another young man who worked at Kelly's club, Al Capone. A lot of these names and gangs will sound familiar between episodes because a lot of these guys were networking or met each other or looked up to each other. So don't be surprised if there's a lot of repeat information. I also want to point out that yet again, we have very little detail about his life as a child except that he immediately turned to gang life which has been a common theme throughout the episodes. Just wanted to make a side note about that because it's intriguing and interesting. It says something about the culture of the time. Capone thought of Torrio as a mentor from their very first meeting. Torrio was not a fan of dressing and behaving like an uneducated street criminal. Not to say that Al was a fan of that, but I think that's implied. <laughs> Instead, he adopted a style that was classy and quiet. He soon picked up a nickname for his stealthy way of doing business, the Fox. He became a true businessman in as much as you can in this criminal setting. He brought in an impressive income from brothels, truck hijacking, and drug trafficking. He opened a large pub in 1904 with a very big brothel upstairs in Manhattan. It is said that Irving Berlin worked there as a singing waiter. Little side trivia for you. A mutual friend of Capone's and Torrio's was Frankie Yale. Realizing that both men were in trouble with New York City law enforcement, he recommended that they make a move to Chicago in 1909. As he settled into his life in Chicago, Johnny married Anna Theodosia Jacob Torrio in 1912 and played the devoted husband, spending the occasional evening with her, humming along to her opera records after dinner. She was content and knew almost nothing of Johnny's constant and illegal business endeavors. Prohibition struck in 1920, and this was simply a new vehicle for profit in Torrio's eyes. He began smuggling and manufacturing illegal liquor and even attempted to bring gang boss and uncle, Big Jim Colosimo, into the fold. But he didn't think the operation was prudent, and he chose not to get involved. That may have been a poor choice on his part uh, because he didn't in fact end up protecting himself very well um, after making that decision. Not long after the offer was refused, Torrio invited Colosimo to dinner at a restaurant for a quote meeting unquote. As soon as Colosimo sat down at his table, a gang of armed men appeared and ended his life on the spot. Torrio, Capone, and Yale were the obvious suspects, but None of them were arrested, ever, or even questioned regarding this obvious homicide. It appeared that there was a hit taken out on him because he stood in the way of the gangs making a profit from prohibition and other ventures. Colosimo had also recently been divorced from his wife. Many of his associates speculated that she had something to do with the plot, having been unhappy with the divorce settlement. In any case, 
the general consensus was that Colosimo had gone soft and was not up to par as a crime boss any longer. Torrio was more than happy to take his place. He took all of his assets, his cash, and began a bootlegging business, business, <laughs> which took in millions of dollars. A lot of people said that uh, Yale was the one that uh, was sent over to kill Colosimo. I've read so many accounts that prove that it was one of them, but nah, nothing stuck, not a thing. Torrio and Capone were ruling over criminal activity in much of Chicago, including the business district and much of the south side of town where several ethnic groups lived. They did not, however, control the Gold Coast, a lake community where the wealthy lived and played. Irish gangster Charles Dion O'Banion and the Northside gang were running that area. O'Banion and Torrio had a questionable truce between them, and O'Banion also had a difficult relationship with violent gang leaders, the Jenna brothers. The allies of the Northside gang waged a war on Torrio, Capone, and the Jenna brothers. On January 24, 1925, O'Banion's men opened fire on Torrio's car as he returned from a shopping trip with his wife, Anna, and hit him at least five times. Bugs Moran was said to have stood over him, uttering the words, This is for Dini O'Banion, and shot him with an empty barrel. Moran, Drucci, Weiss, and Gutenberg thought he was dead, but he survived. This assault left him a changed man. Torrio was near death for a week, his jaw was shattered, and he had multiple debilitating injuries. To put it lightly, Johnny was so spooked that he never returned to his former duties. He was unable to be seen in public for fear of another attack, and before long, he had passed his business and his title on to young Al Capone. Capone used excessive violence to squeeze more money out of Torrio's businesses, which had not been hurting. When Torrio left everything to Al, the Torrio empire had grossed about 70 million a year. That's nearly a billion dollars in modern calculation. The gang war that began between these rivals would rage on for years, culminating in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre orchestrated by Capone, getting revenge for his predecessor and pal and mentor. Torrio took his wife and mother and moved back to Italy. Disgusted with the level of violence between the gangs, he remained there for several years, returning to the United States in the 1930s only to testify on behalf of Al Capone during his tax evasion trial. During that trip to New York, Torrio met Lucky Luciano and made a recommendation to him to stop the gang wars and create a conglomerate of gangs working together toward their mutual benefit. Luciano fell in love with the idea and took it to the other bosses. They created what was known as the Syndicate, the Commission, or the Outfit. It was a governing body for gangs across the United States and changed organized crime drastically, although it did not eradicate the violence. Torrio was charged with income tax evasion himself in 1936. He appealed multiple times but ended up being convicted and sent to prison in 1939. He served two years, and in 1940, Torrio sold a property that he co-owned with Capone and other business partners. It fetched a good enough price at auction to pay off the funds he owed for his tax debt. He was released from prison and had no other involvement in crime until his death. Very little is recorded about Torrio's life after his prison sentence. What we do know is that he was a private man who ran his affairs behind closed doors for much of his life, hence the extreme lack of information about his personal life. His protective secrecy was exemplified when on April 16, 1957, Torrio sat down in a Brooklyn barbershop chair and had a heart attack. He died several hours later in a New York City hospital. No one but his immediate family and associates, including the media, learned about his death until a full three weeks had passed. 
It was a shock to everyone who knew him. A mundane end to a life surrounded by the chaos of the crime world. And that short and sweet little bit is the story of Johnny Torrio. Not a lot of details, not as many as I usually like to dig up, and believe me, I used at least five or six sources for his biography. Um, I did include one of those sources in, of course, my links in the description. There are going to be links to his bio, some additional photos of his businesses, people in his life. Um, there were a couple of little side stories that I could have included, but really I want to focus more on their business and their personal life in this series. And that is what I was able to dig up on Mr. Torrio. There are also some other cool scenes in the description. There's a Boardwalk Empire depiction of the shooting of Johnny Torrio, which is not necessarily completely accurate, but, but they did a good job, as well as uh, an excerpt from The Making of the Mob, the not coming back scene, where Capone visits Torrio in the hospital, and Torrio tells him that he's terrified, basically, that he doesn't want to come back, that he, he doesn't feel it's important enough for him to come back and continue to run his business. So he gives everything over to Capone. That scene was, was quite good. I dare say that they depicted Capone in a much more sensitive light than I imagine him in my mind's eye. I don't know, you take a look, tell me what you think. Very interesting stuff. There is so much information out there, as I've said before, about the mob, um, the mafia, and all the other gangs uh, that, are, that were out there and are, well, still out there. Um, very interesting stuff, especially historically, how they grew up and how they lived their lives. Johnny Torrio, by and large, was a very uh, calm and somewhat peaceful man for being a mob member, a, a mob leader, and he was very secretive. He kept his stuff to himself and can't fault the man for that. So we have a short but sweet story, and yet it's interesting to hear about Capone's predecessor and exactly how some of these things came to light, like the syndicate. Very fascinating. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed the short story. I said that three times now. It was short. There's four. Okay. <laughs> but I do hope you're enjoying the series as well. There will be um, probably two or three more episodes of hideouts covering these gentlemen from this immediate era uh, that I want to share with you. And then on to some other things including the 1930s Time Traveler House. Uh, that will be probably in another month or so. Uh, but we do have another project that's brewing, another horror project. I'm dropping a little, little tidbit of information there for you, get you excited about that. I hope you'll come back for all of those things. And thank you so much for your support. Thank you also for 300 subscribers. It took me a while, but all of us did it. We got to 300 and I'm excited about what comes next and getting maybe to 500 will be an amazing journey as well. There will be lots of cool projects and I want to include people and their feedback in those projects if I can. Looking forward to all of that. Thank you again. Until next time, you can enjoy the rest of this modest little apartment build, uh, which I think is fairly accurate. <laughs> Aren't a lot of pictures of the interior, but I hope you enjoy what's left. I will see all of you in the next episode. Well, you'll hear me, I won't see you. <laughs> Until then, I hope you are all happy, safe, and very healthy, and that you have a beautiful day.
Ha, ha, ha.